Uh, so we have two topics to cover today. We have one problem on uh, Kyle's model from last week. And we also have a problem on Glosten's model from this Wednesday. So let us start in the chronological order. Uh, and yeah, one thing I forgot to say is, obviously, if you have any questions as we go, please ask in chat. That's what we're here for. That's why we're doing it live in front of a live audience rather than just a recording. Okay, so for Kyle's model, we had one exercise, which was exercise three in chapter four of the textbook, and it explored competition among speculators. So what we had there was uh, basically a standard Kyle model, except instead of one speculator, we now have many speculators who compete with each other to some extent. So I realized that last week was a long time ago and a lot of things have happened since then. So let us do a quick refresher on what Kyle model actually is and how it looks like. These are slides from last week. And this is the setup of uh, Kyle model. So in that model, we had in class one informed trader, the speculator, one dealer or market maker, and also implicitly one noise trader who is not on this slide. So agents are same as in Gloucester Milgram model. Uh, and the way the model worked is we had one asset with some fundamental value V, which was normally distributed. And this normal distribution is one of the uh, essential parts of the Kyle's model. The speculator knew this fundamental value V and decided on um, which market order to place. So X is the volume of trade that um, is announced in his market order. This X can be any number, positive or negative, so the speculator can decide to buy or sell depending on V. Uh, and um, Noise Trader submitted some random order, U. And U was also normally distributed with mean zero. Market Maker or Dealer submitted a supply schedule. So basically what, what the dealer did is he said, if the total market order today is of size Q, then I will clear all of it at the same price P. And this price P obviously depends on the uh, total order size Q. And the total order size is composed from however much the speculators want to trade X and how much noise traders want to trade U. We assume that market makers are competitive or one market maker is competitive, which is a bit of an exumeron, but uh, we'll stick with it which means that the price must be fair. So price at which the dealer trades, given quantity Q, must be equal to the expected value of the fundamental uh, value V, conditional on the total order size Q. And what we did is we first of all assumed that the speculator uses some linear strategy so his order size Q, order size X is proportional to the departure of the fundamental V from the ex ante uh, market valuation of the asset mu. So mu is ex ante expectation of V. And proportionality coefficient is some beta, which is something that we need to find. This is the unknown parameter, um, and this is determined in equilibrium. Beta is what we call speculator's aggression. So it's how aggressively the speculator trades conditional on his information, how big of an order he submits given some fixed departure of V from mu. So now going to the dealer's price setting strategy. 
we already said that the market price, the price that the dealer sets, must be equal to the expected uh, value of the fundamental conditional on order size. And what we have in this model, due to linearity of the speculator strategy and joint normality of our random variables v and u, is uh, we have this nice linear price impact equation. So we get this conditional expectation that we are looking for is equal to mu plus uh, lambda times q, lambda times the total order size. And lambda here is our price impact coefficient. And we claim that in this case, it is equal to this covariance of v and q over variance of q. We did not derive this explicitly, but um, once again, the slides have this derivation. We just did not go through it. And for today, we'll also uh, just take this for granted. Have faith in this result, that market price uh, will be given by a linear price impact equation and lambda will be given by these terms. Okay, so this was a refresher of, of what we did in class last week. Now let us get back to the exercise at hand. This exercise is, once again, almost the very same model. The only difference that we have now is we have many speculators. So instead of one informed trader, we have n informed traders. They all know um, v perfectly. They all know the fundamental value of the asset. But they realize that they cannot affect the behavior of fellow speculators. So they take uh, the order sizes of their fellow speculators as granted. We will assume that, uh, like in class, every speculator now uses linear strategy and uh, our equilibrium is symmetric, meaning that order size xi for every trader will be given by, will be once again proportional to the departure of v from mu by the magnitude of the private information that the speculator has. And the proportionality coefficient beta will be the same for all speculators. So this is the problem setup. We have not even asked any questions yet. And here's the first one. Find the equilibrium aggressiveness of the traders, beta, and determine how it depends on n and explain why. So basically, we need to solve for speculators' best response to behavior of all other agents in the market, of other speculators and of the, of the dealer who sets the price schedule. So let us do that. Let us go to the blackboard. This, this. So now I will type things in real time and you tell me if uh, the font is too small or too large. Oh, apologies, this. I keep forgetting to press the right buttons. So what we need to do is we need to solve the trader speculator's maximization problem. We have speculator i, and he maximizes his expected profit, which is given by the expectation of order size times profit on any given trade. So profit function is absolute same that we had in class. So he maximizes this with respect to xi. He chooses his trade uh, size xi optimally. And we have, um, let's say, derived, so we have, we, we are assume 
and I'll put in brackets have derived the linear price impact equation. So we will assume that the dealer sets prices according to this equation for some lambda. And if we plug our total order size Q in here, we will get that um, it looks as follows from the perspective of speculator I. The total order size in the market is given by the order size of speculator I, right? Plus, however much all other speculators want to trade, so sum of xj for all j is not equal to i, plus the order size of the uninformed traders. And as I also said, we are assuming uh, that all other speculators in the market, apart from I, are following linear trading strategies. So from the perspective of trader I, the way that the price will depend on his order size and on the fundamental value V will be given by, once we substitute, um, once we substitute the sum of xj's, beta times V minus mu. It's difficult to type and talk at the same time. I got used to writing and talking to some extent, but typing is still difficult. So the sum of order sizes of all other players, of all other speculators xj, will be given by this term, because every speculator's order size xi is given by beta times v minus mu, and there are n minus 1 of such traders. So this is how the price will look like from the perspective of trader i, conditional on his order size xi and on the true fundamental value v. So let us plug this price into the speculator's expected profit expression. We will have, uh, let me copy this, that the expected profit equals the expectation of xi times v minus all this price. So v minus mu minus lambda times xi plus n minus 1 times beta times v minus mu. Oh no. Here plus the order size of the uninformed traders u. So it looks a little long and ugly, but we'll roll with it. Let us continue. So what, has, what, what is this expectation? What is uncertain in this expression from the point of view of the speculator I? We have a question. Why isn't it N times the speculator's submission strategy? The answer is we are looking at the problem of speculator I <clears throat> and uh, the speculator chooses his own order size X. So at this point we are speculator I does not follow a fixed strategy but he chooses how much to trade. And our idea is that we will find this optimal X I and we will show that it is in the end linear. But from the point of view of trader I, behavior of all other traders is given. And in equilibrium, it is given by N um, every other speculator submits order size xj given by this, and there are n minus one of such speculators. So this xi plus n minus 1 
times uh, beta times v minus mu, is the order size of all speculators. Got it. Good. Okay, let's move on. So, going back to this expectation, <coughs> to this expected profit, what is uncertain from the point of view of speculator I? He knows how much he will be wanting to trade. He knows the order size that he will submit, Xi. He knows V. He knows Mu. Everyone knows Mu. Lambda is also known in equilibrium. Xi is once again known. N is known because it is a parameter of the model. Beta, the aggressiveness of all other speculators, will be known in equilibrium to speculator I, so speculator I will have some idea of how they trade. So the only thing we have we are left with is U. Indeed, speculator I does not know how much noise traders will be willing to trade, what will be their order size. And this is the only thing that uh, he doesn't know. Meaning that this expectation can be rewritten as this. Oh, sorry. This. So the only thing we need to take expectation over is this u, and everything else is known. And as we know, as we know, the expected value of the noise traders order is zero because we assumed so. So this expected value of u is just zero. So now we have an expression for trader i's expected profit. And let us um, maximize it. So trader i chooses this order size xi in order to maximize this equation. Maximize this expected profit with respect to Xi. And the first order condition of this maximization problem will look as follows. So the, the derivative of the expected profit with respect to Xi must be equal to zero. This is our necessary condition for maximization. And if you look closely at this expected profit, you'll see that it is mostly linear in Xi, apart from this lambda Xi term, which will be a square. So taking derivative of all that, we will have V minus mu minus lambda times 2 x i from the square term, let's put 2 here, and then minus lambda times n minus 1 beta v minus mu. And this should be equal to 0. So we need to find out what xi is from this equation. So solving it for xi, we get that uh, it's equal to v minus mu times something. So if you look closely, you have v minus mu minus something else times v minus mu. And we take this middle term to another side. So what we will have is 1 minus lambda times n minus 1 times beta divided by 2 lambda. This is how our optimal trading strategy will look like for speculator i. Or the first expression that we have for it. In particular, 
this Xi is indeed linear in V minus mu with some proportionality coefficient given by this fraction. Meaning that this fraction is exactly beta. So we have assumed that Xi is equal to beta times V minus mu. And in the end, we get that this fraction is our beta. Notice, however, that we have beta on the left-hand side here and on the right-hand side. So let's just solve for beta explicitly. We'll have that... Um, so let's multiply both sides by 2 lambda. We'll have 2 lambda beta equal to 1 minus lambda n minus 1 beta. Uh, nope. This is the same as this. So taking this lambda times n minus 1 n minus 1 times beta to the left hand side we will get that um, lambda times n minus 1 plus 2 so we will have n plus 1 times beta will be equal to just 1 that's all that's left on the right hand side so just divide both sides by this now to get that beta is equal to 1 over lambda times n plus 1. This is our answer. This is the optimal trading strategy of trader i. So the proportionality coefficient, the aggressiveness of trader i will be given by this expression. Now let us go back to the slides and see exactly that. So this is a gist, a gist of what we just did. And here we get the same answer that I just derived, which is always a good signal. It means either I did something wrong twice or everything's correct. Okay, so we have found the equilibrium aggressiveness beta. Now let us determine how it depends on n and try to explain why. So how does it depend on n? First of all, of course, the beta itself is decreasing in n. The more speculators there are in the market, the less each and, sin each and every single one of them trades. And this is... Well, relatively straightforward, right? It should be pretty trivial. So, suppose that um, they all jointly maximize profits of all speculators, so they are colluding with each other. Then the total aggressiveness of that cartel should be equal to exactly what we had in single-agent Glossen-Milgram model. So, we would have n times beta in the cartel would be equal to just beta from the single agent model. Meaning that taking the size of the pi fixed, the size of the trade fixed, the more traders there are, the smaller is the share of um, every single trader in that trade size, in the total trade size. However, of course, the speculators are not actually colluding. Every single one of them is acting in their own self-interest. And uh, this total trade size and beta will not be constant. So it is actually interesting to look how this n beta will depend on n. And what we see is that n beta will be increasing in n. So you'll have n over n plus 1 times lambda. And this n over n plus 1 term is smaller than 1, and it will approach 1 as we increase n. 
to understand this, well, the, the idea is once again completely the same as in Cournot oligopoly compared to monopoly. In this setting, what is the trade-off that each speculator uh, faces, is facing? The trader would want to trade a lot in order to exploit, um, in order to reap profits from, uh, from the fundamental value V being above or below the exante expectation mu and therefore the price. However, the more any single trader trades, the worse is the price that he is facing. So the trade-off is between trading more and trading at a better price. And the two are balancing out somehow. The more traders there are, the smaller is the share, the market share of any single trader. Meaning that in relative terms, the smaller is the externality that speculator I imposes on the price. The smaller is the effect, I guess, in relative terms, on the price from speculator I increasing his output by, say, 1%. Excuse me, I, need, I needed to cough. Um, so the more traders there are, the smaller is the effect of any single one of them on the price, meaning that the trade-off between trading more and trading at a better price, um, in this trade-off, all traders take the first one. They want to trade more uh, by more because they realize that the, their effect on prices is smaller. So, conclusion, the more traders there are in the market, the more aggressively they all trade. And the larger is the cumulative depth in the market. If there are any questions, ask them, and otherwise we will move on. The next part of the problem is to derive the price impact coefficient lambda from the dealer's zero profit condition. <clears throat> so let us go back to the blackboard. No, not this, sorry. This. So this will be B. We have assumed initially that our price, which is given by expectation of V conditional on Q, by competitiveness of the dealers, satisfies this linear price impact equation. So it's given by mu plus lambda times q. Where lambda is given by this covariance of v and q divided by variance of q. So we have assumed it today, we have assumed it in lecture. Once again, we have, there are derivations available to you if you're interested. So for now, we're living in this world. And our quest is to get from here to somewhere. So have a more explicit representation of this lambda. Let us do that. <clears throat> So we have lambda equal to this covariance over variance. Well, let me co copy this. And let us plug in the expressions that we have for Q. So now we are looking at the dealer, at the market maker. And from the point of view of the dealer, how is this total order size Q determined? 
we have n speculators and the dealer takes all of their behavior as given. So the dealer assumes that they all follow this linear strategy. So each of these n traders submits order size beta times v minus mu, and there are n traders now. And then we also have trade size of the uninformed traders. And we'll plug the same q here in the variance. So let us work with this expression. Covariance is a linear operator, so we can, sorry, what happened? Okay, I pressed something wrong. So we can split this sum into two. We'll have covariance of v and n beta v minus mu plus the covariance of v and u. And in the denominator, we have the variance of the two. So we should... Now let's write it fully. So to split this, we will have variance of n times beta times v minus mu plus the variance of u plus Or maybe minus. I actually keep forgetting. No, plus. <coughs> Excuse me. Plus two covariances of these two terms. Uh, sorry. So two times covariance of n beta v minus mu and u. Now, plugging in all we know, or I guess not yet. So let us take out the constants. In this first term, in this first term, uh, we have only v as our end of variables, while n and beta and mu are all fixed. So we will have n times. Uh, beta times the covariance of v and v. And we could again, once again split this uh, sum, this difference as a difference of covariances. But then we'll have covariance of v with n times beta times mu, which is a constant. And covariance of anything with a constant is zero. So we are left with just this plus the covariance of v and u. And we know that v and u are independent, so this covariance is zero. I guess let me write zero here. I'm being inconsistent in where I do write zeros and where I do not. In the bottom we have variance of this expression in the denominator. Once again, we can throw away mu because it is a constant because it will not affect the variance of the whole expression. So we will have variance of n times beta times v. And taking out the constants, we will have n squared beta squared times the variance of v plus the variance of u. Just leave it as is for now. Plus two covariances between n beta v minus mu and u. Now splitting this once again in two, we'll have covariance of n beta v and u minus covariance of n beta mu and u. Both will be zero because firstly v and u are independent and n beta mu is a constant. So it does not co-vary with u. So we'll have zero here. And then just plugging in uh, the sigmas instead of these fancy letters, we will get that we have n beta times the covariance of v and v is just the variance of v. So we'll have sigma squared v 
In the denominator, we have n times beta squared times sigma square v plus <coughs> the variance of u, which is sigma square u. So this is our lambda. This is our price impact coefficient as derived from the zero profit condition. It looks very similar to what we had in class, right? We did not have n, obviously n was 1. And you can see that if you set n equal to 1, we will get exactly what we had in class. Okay, let us go back to the slides. Nope, nope. Nope, sorry. Here. So this is what we just derived. And so now we have two expressions. We have lambda in terms of beta from the dealer zero profit condition. And we also have from part A, beta in terms of lambda from the speculator's optimal strategy. So we can combine the two and solve for lambda and beta. And we will get these two expressions. Again, if you substitute n equal to 1, you will get exactly what we had in the lecture. So let's talk about it now. And part C asks us, what is the market depth in equilibrium? How is it affected by an increase in the number of informed traders n? And what is the economic intuition for this result? And also, do you think that this result is robust? So first of all, what is market depth? Market depth is just the inverse of the price impact, right? Price impact tells us by how much the price will move if we trade one unit of the asset. Market depth tells us how many units we need to trade in order to move price by $1. So depth is 1 over lambda, and just plugging in the lambda that we just found will give us this expression. n plus 1 over square root of n times the ratio of variances. So how does it depend on the number of informed traders? We see that depth is increasing in n, meaning the more traders there are, the deeper is the market, the less the price moves. And this happens because traders become more aggressive, as we have found in part A. So on any given amount of information, they trade more aggressively. They submit larger orders Xi given any fixed fundamental value V. Now, the last part asks us whether we think that this result is robust. And here, um, a very particular answer is expected. And uh, we have not seen in class the things that we need to answer it. So let me show you what is the idea behind it. So if we go back to the blackboard, just... Um, Four, three, c we have these two equations. We have price impact coefficient in terms of beta from the zero profit condition. And we also have uh, beta times 1 over lambda n plus 1 from the trader's optimization. So let us plot these two curves in term in the space of lambdas and betas. So this will look as follows. Now 
Now I cannot draw, especially with a mouse, so this will look horrible, but stay with me. So we'll have beta on one axis and one over lambda market depth on another axis. And so we want to draw the curves given by those two equations that we had in this space. So first of all, for sp uh, speculator strategy, it was just beta equals to 1 over lambda times some constant, right? So this will be a linear function. Well, this is surprisingly straight. I thought I would do worse. So this is a linear function. Uh, if we... No, sorry. This is this function. Now, the second function is a little bit difficult to draw because it is very non-linear. But, once again, I ask you to trust me that it will look as follows. It will be not a parabola, but uh, some convex function. And the twist is, if you do the motions and if you check things, you will see that the intersection of the two curves happens at the minimum of this uh, curve. So this is a surprising result. I don't want to stop too closely on it. I just want to give you a geometric intuition that uh, textbooks, textbook wants from us. This, however, only happens for uh, the single player case. So for the version of the model that we had in class, where n was equal to 1. Now let us draw things for some higher m, for example, 2. And I'll do this in a different color. So what happens when there are more traders in the market? We see that this uh, expression from the speculator strategy, let me rewrite it slightly. Let me take n plus 1 to the left-hand side. We can draw it like this. So you see that this expression com compresses beta by a factor of n plus 1. While in the top expression, beta is compressed by a factor of n. So when n grows, beta will be proportional to 1 over n of the old beta. And here beta will be proportional to uh, 2 over n plus 1 of the old beta. So just if we draw this, we will have something like this will be the new um, function from the speculator strategy. And from zero profit, we'll have something like this. So the old curve compressed a little bit. But the point is, it will intersect no longer at the minimum, but at this increasing part. So this is and say 2. So what happens is, as we increase n, our intersection moves along this um, increasing part of the price impact uh, equality. The higher is the n, the higher we will climb on the slope. So, as uh, I should not try to write this, as n grows, our market depth 1 over lambda will also increase. But the point is, what I am doing this all for, is this only happens because our old intersection for n equals 1 was at the minimum. So if we had a different uh, picture from the start, say if we had something like this, where the intersection was not at the minimum to start with, then once we compress these things appropriately, 
Again, this is very schematic. We will once again move kind of right along this curve. Our intersection, our solution will move right along this convex line. And if it was not at the minimum for n equals to 1, it will kind of decrease at first and then increase, meaning our market depth might decrease as we as we increase the number of informed traders from one to say two to three, but then it will start growing back up again. So this, the, what I've just given you is a very geometric intuition with very little economic intuition, very little explanation for why it happens. It relates a little bit to the discussion we had on the uh, back in class last week for why, uh, yeah, sorry, for the shape of this function, or at least how market, sorry, how does the price impact coefficient depend on beta? So I told you that it decreases at first for small values of beta, and then it starts increasing. And this is exactly the picture that shows it. So these, this is the curve, right? We show it. Uh, depth decreases for in beta for low values of beta, and then it starts increasing. And I gave you ex explanations. I gave you the two driving forces that uh, conflict here, that drive this behavior. And I will not try to explain them again, because this will not end well. And this is what the textbook expects us to answer to this robustness question. So to summarize, in this problem we have that depth is increasing in n, but one source where this stems from is strategy of the, oh, I forgot to push the button. Yes losing my train of thought. Uh, this depends on traders' trading behavior. And if they have some reason to be less aggressive, which is what happened in the second graph I drew, if they have some reason to be less aggressive than in this particular setup, in this particular model, one example is they have inventory risk, they are risk averse. or they no let's just stick with risk aversion so if dealers were risk averse they would trade less aggressively so we would have the second picture that we had like this and so the conclusion that depth would be increasing in n would no longer hold This is my final, final answer. Now, there's also part D. Let's deal with this really quickly. Part D asks us to compute the ex-ante expected profit of each informed investor and to compute the effect of an increase in N on this aggregate profit of informed investors. Okay, how do I ban people from the chat? Oh, ban. Bots. Oh, no bots in chat. So let us try to <clears throat> compute the expected profit. Back to the blackboard. Sorry, this. In... 4.3 part D. Our expected profit <coughs> is given by the expectation of Xi times V minus mu 
uh, sorry, V minus P. And now let us plug in everything we know. Now we know how P looks, the price impact, and we know how Xi looks as a function of V. So we have the expectation of X is uh, just beta times V minus mu. And so we have V minus P. If we substitute the P that we had, we'll have um, mu minus lambda times N informed traders, N beta V minus uh, mu plus the uninformed uh, trade size U. Here we are asked about the ex ante profit of trader I, meaning profit before the trader knows what V is. So in this expectation, not only U is uncertain, but V is treated as random as well. So we are evaluating this expectation before the informed trader knows uh, V. So how can we do it? Uh, let's say if we collect the terms a little bit, no, nope. this, we have V minus mu. And then in this inside bracket, we once again have V minus mu twice. So we'll have V minus mu times one minus <coughs> lambda and beta. And we have U inside here. So splitting this expectation in two, have the expectation of beta times one minus lambda n beta times v minus mu squared plus the expectation of beta times v minus mu times u. So this is a constant, so we can take it out of the expectation. And here, from here, you can start using, well, first of all, basic probability, because expectation of a square of a random variable is intimately connected to its variance. And in this particular case, since the expected value of v minus mu is zero, this expectation of a square of v minus mu will just be equal to variance of v minus mu meaning the variance of V. So we'll have beta times 1 minus lambda and beta times sigma squared V. And this expectation will be a what? Will be connected to a covariance. Now I cannot think on the spot how it will work out. So let us instead get right back to the slides and see how it worked out. And we get this. There are a few more steps missing. In particular, we in the meanwhile have plugged in the expressions for beta and lambda that we had. But in the end, the expected profit you will get if you do all the motions get slowly and carefully is this. So once again, predictably, the profits of each individual speculator are decreasing in N. The more informed traders there are, the smaller is the profit of every, any single one of them. And that is once again a trivial part. But more interestingly, sorry, the uh, aggregate profit of all speculators so this expression multiplied by n will also be decreasing in n. Because when there was one informed investor, one speculator, he maximized his profits. 
if when there are many informed speculators if all of them were maximizing all of the speculators profits so they were colluding acting in a cartel they would arrive to the same solution they would get the maximal possible profit so now when they are not actually colluding but rather acting in their own self-interest it is rather intuitive that um, that they will not achieve as high of, of a profit, any single one of them. So their aggregate profit will be decreasing. And the more informed traders there are, the higher N is, the more they compete with each other and the lower is the aggregate profit of all of them. So this was problem four, sorry, problem three from chapter four. Let me take a quick break here, and we are due for a break anyway. If you have any questions in the meanwhile, post them in chat. And let us reconnect in, say, five minutes. It probably doesn't make sense to take the whole 15. So let us take a five-minute break, and we'll get to Gloston model right after that. <laughs> 